This Tuesday, April 19th, 2011, will mark the 16th anniversary of the bombing of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. It was while the American nation was still reeling from that terrible national tragedy that one family in that nation experienced its own private tragedy, the death of one of its own. The details of the death of Kenneth Trenadu can be found widely online, and I would suggest kennethtrenadu.com as a starting point for that research. And from a link from kennethtrenadu.com, we have a Mother Jones story from 2007, In Search of John Doe No. 2, the story the feds never told about the Oklahoma City bombing. Quote, Kenny Trenadu was driving a 1986 Chevy pickup when he was pulled over at the Mexican border on his way home to San Diego on June 10, 1995. He was dark-haired, 5 feet 8 inches, and well-muscled, a former athlete who had picked up construction work after he quit robbing banks. His left forearm bore a dragon tattoo. Highway patrol officers ran his license and found that it had been suspended and that he was wanted for parole violations. After two months in jail in San Diego, Trinidad was shipped on August 18th to a prison in Oklahoma City for a hearing on the parole violations. The move placed Kenny in close proximity to the most famous federal prisoner in America. In one way or another, it also sealed his fate. Four months earlier, another car had been stopped by a state trooper some 80 miles north of Oklahoma City. It was 10.20 a.m. on April 19, 1995, and much of the country was still waking up to the enormity of what had happened earlier that morning when an explosives-laden rider truck gutted the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, killing 168 people. The driver of the 1977 Mercury Marquis was arrested for carrying a concealed weapon and driving without tags. He gave his name as Timothy McVeigh. Two days later, McVeigh was identified as the John Doe No. 1 wanted in the bombing, and fellow anti-government extremist Terry Nichols turned himself into police. They were indicted on August 10th, and federal authorities said they had their men. But there were many who didn't buy the tidy closure. A sprawling Great Plains town known for its tornadoes, Oklahoma City was already the center of a swirl of theories about the crime, all of them insisting that the two men could not have acted alone. Some refused to give up on the idea of Middle Eastern terrorists, speculating about a plot headed by Saddam Hussein. Others suspected an inside job by the feds. Some simply stuck to the far more plausible conviction that there were co-conspirators not yet apprehended. After all, immediately following the bombing, law enforcement had been searching furiously for a man whom numerous sources said they saw with McVeigh, and who by some accounts was seen walking away from the rider truck. The characters whose police composite sketch became known around the world as John Doe No. 2. According to the police description, this man was about 5 feet 9, muscular, and dark-haired. By some accounts, he drove an older model pickup truck and had a dragon tattooed on his left forearm. Kenny's brother, Jesse Trinidou, knew nothing about the resemblance between his brother and the nation's most wanted man but he now believes it sparked the events that would launch him on a 12-year investigation of a prison mystery and a massive government stonewalling effort. In the process, he would discover documents showing that even as the Justice Department was working to convict what it insisted were only two conspirators, its agents were actively investigating a wider plot, a plot whose possible ramifications they concealed from defense lawyers and from a public that, at a delicate moment in an election year, they were anxious to reassure. End quote. Well, I will leave the readers to go to motherjones.com and follow the link from the Corbett Report documentation section of today's podcast episode and read through that for yourself. And you can find some of the other details that that report includes about the death of Kenneth Trenadu and the work of his brother, Salt Lake City based attorney Jesse Trenadu, in trying to uncover what really happened in that death. But I'll, as I say, I'll leave you to do that for yourself on your own time, and I think you will find that Mother Jones, of course, does not go very far in trying to get to the real bottom of this mystery. But at least that sets the stage for who Kenneth Trenadu is and the significance of the story and its possible relation to the Oklahoma City bombing. And it's there that we will start really exploring this issue, this really incredibly unresolved issue in the Oklahoma City investigation that has been 
like an open sore on the American government and the public who has been led along to believe that these two conspirators, Terry Nichols and Tim McVeigh, represent the be-all and end-all of the Oklahoma City bombing for the past 16 years. As the documents uncovered by Jesse Trenadu show, that is very much not the case. There was a lot more going on here than the public could ever imagine if they were going only by official government pronouncements on the matter. And it all starts with the death of Kenneth Trenadu, which was labeled a suicide. Now, if you go to tr kennethtrenadu.com, you can take a look at the pictures of the corpse for yourself. And I must warn listeners out there that it is extremely graphic, but it does show beyond shadow of a doubt that there was torture and murder in the case of Ken Trenadu, and it was not a suicide. And there are mu there is much more documentation and evidence to go along with that. So in order to start exploring this issue, let's take a listen to an excerpt from an interview that I conducted earlier this week with Jesse Trenadu, Kenneth Trenadu's brother. Jesse Trenadu, as I've said, is a Salt Lake City-based attorney, a former law professor, and someone who had absolutely no inkling of an understanding that his brother's death was in any way related to the Oklahoma City bombing back when all of this began in 1995. But as many listeners out there may know, as I have referenced it several times on the podcast, the story of Kenneth Trenadu and now his brother Jesse Trenadu is an incredible one that really goes to the very heart of what the government is attempting to cover up in the Oklahoma City bombing. And for that reason, although it's a very familiar refrain on this podcast that I urge listeners to go and listen to the interview in its entirety, I would once again really wholeheartedly encourage people to listen to this interview, which in some ways may be one of the most important that I've ever conducted, because the information that Jesse Trenadu has managed to bring to light because of his Freedom of Information Act requests and his tireless crusade to bring more information about the death of his brother to the eye of the public is so valuable, it's so important, that I can't really think of many more subjects that would be more important for a podcast like this one to cover. So without talking about it too much, let's get straight into that excerpt from the interview where Jesse talks about his brother and his brother's death. Well, Jesse Trenadu, my, my longtime listeners will no doubt be somewhat familiar with the story of your brother and how it relates to the OKC, OKC bombing. And it's a story that I have referenced numerous times before on my podcast and in my videos. And that story generally begins with your brother's death. But before we get to that part of the story, I would like to take a moment to hear a bit about your brother and your relationship with him. Because I think it's easy to forget that we are talking about a real human being here who really did lose his life for what it now appears was a case of mistaken identity. So can you flesh that out for us and, and tell us a little bit about your brother and the kind of person that he was? Well, we grew up in a, a southern Appalachian coal camp and had the good fortune to be able to migrate to California in the early 1960s. Uh, Kenny uh, was a very bright man, uh, very popular. He, unfortunately, at, at that time is when the drug problems were starting to, to come onto the, the American scene. And he got into um, drug use. He enlisted in the Army. And like so many people during the Vietnam War, especially young men, came back as heroin addicts. And he, he, to support his habit, he robbed a bank. He was caught. He confessed and pled guilty and went and did his, his time in jail. And uh, he served his time. He married, uh, had a little boy. And uh, his son was only two months old when he was murdered. But my brother was a, you know, we never condoned his bank robbery or any, anything like that, but he was a good person. Uh, he struggled with his addictions and he overcame his addiction. And, and as I, that, well, as I understand, um, when he was picked up and and taken to the Oklahoma City Federal uh, Correction uh, Center, I, I understand that you were in touch with him even the day before that he was actually mur murdered. Yes. He was picked up in, in San Diego. And the, he When he was released from prison, he had a probation officer that didn't approve of drinking. 
And my brother worked construction and working construction, well, you, even if you don't work construction, people drink beer. And his probation officer put a no beer drinking condition on his parole. And my brother said, and I fought that. We, we went all through the administrative appeals on that and lost. And my brother basically said to his probation officer, he said, I'm going to drink beer. You know where I live. If you think that's enough to send me back to prison, come and get me. And of course they didn't. And he was out from about 1987 until 1995 uh, after the Oklahoma City bombing. And suddenly he is, he is picked up allegedly for a parole violation and sent to Oklahoma City for what we were told would be a parole violation hearing. He arrived there on a Friday night. I spoke with him Saturday evening. He was supposed to call back Sunday, and this was he arrived on Friday the 18th of August, 1995. I spoke to him on the 19th of August, the Saturday, for about 20 minutes, uh, talking about his parole hearing and how that you know it was, there was no way they were going to send him back to jail for drinking beer. Um, and on Sunday, he was supposed to call me back, and he didn't. And on Monday morning, my mother received a call. This was August 21st, 1995, from the warden at the Federal Transfer Center in Oklahoma City, uh, saying my brother had committed suicide and asking for permission to have his body cremated. And, of course, she refused. My mother refused that request. It took about a week of fighting with the federal government to have his body released, uh, we found out later that during that time period, the federal government had made two attempts to have his body cremated. When he arrived home, he was uh, covered in makeup, and my mother, his wife, and my sister removed the makeup. I was on my way to Southern California, in Orange County, where they had sent the body, where his wife and my family still live. Uh, when I arrived, he had been beaten head to toe. His skull was split in three places, his throat had been cut, uh, even the soles of his feet had been beaten. Um, and the government said it was a suicidal hang. And what we never had was a motive for his death. Uh, people would say to you, why would the federal government torture, and he was tortured, and, and murder your brother? And we had no explanation for that. Uh, another thing about the case that was always unexplainable was the fact that so much evidence disappeared. Uh, my brother was supposedly found with blood-stained clothing, but when his body was turned over to the medical examiner two hours later, his clothes are gone. He's wearing nothing but boxer shorts. Uh, the video camera, supposedly that would monitor access to my brother, malfunctioned. The log books that would have shown who came and went from the institution with access to my brother either disappeared or the pages on the date my brother was there, dates my brother was there, were torn out. Uh, the crime scene photographs disappear. The medical examiner is not allowed access to the death scene. When he finally is allowed access to the death scene, four months later, it had been uh, painted and cleaned up. And this is all done by the the FBI and the Department of Justice. And we could never understand why this kind of, of resistance was coming from the government. Uh, before before we move on, so so just to be clear, he was picked up for uh, allegedly a parole violation in San Diego, and then he was transferred to Oklahoma City. That's a considerable distance. Uh, is that, I mean, how unusual is, is that in itself? I don't practice um, criminal law, although... But, I laugh, still laugh at it. Some people say it's a crime. I'm a lawyer, but uh, I now know. At the time, it didn't seem unusual because we, I knew nothing about criminal law. I now know that that it should not have happened. Uh, the crime he committed was in Southern California, the robbery. His probation officer was in Southern California. The judge who sentenced him was in Southern California. Um, he should have been brought back in front of the judge who had sentenced him, and they would have had a hearing on whether or not he had violated his parole. He shouldn't have been sent to Oklahoma, and there was no way that Oklahoma could have handled, the judge in Oklahoma could have handled that parole revocation hearing. So it shouldn't have happened. But at the time, it did not seem, there was nothing that struck me as unusual because I just simply didn't know the, the procedure in the, in the criminal justice system. 
and but what I did learn later, and it came about over the course of years, was about six months after my it was, it was December of 1995 or January of 1995, I received a, a, an anonymous phone call, and this was back before we had telephones that would show you who's calling and and everything else, and computers were very primitive then, and cell phones were the size of bricks almost, I, if you recall, in the mid 1990s. But I received a phone call from this person who said, I want you to know that your brother was murdered by the FBI. It was a case of mistaken identity. He fit the profile of a group of people who were robbing banks to get money to attack the federal government, sort of a, a militia movement type operation. And I, of course, uh, and what, I remember the words. I said it was an interrogation that went wrong. And... I just sort of dismissed it as a crank call from, from, and I got a lot of those at the time trying to find out what happened to my brother. And then about June or July 1996, I see an article in the Los Angeles Times talking about a man named Richard Lee Guthrie who had been found hanging in his cell in federal custody. And it was the day before Guthrie had said that he was going to give an interview to the Los Angeles Times that would blow the lid off the Oklahoma City bombing. And it just simply said that Guthrie belonged to a, a, a group of bank robbers. And I didn't focus much on Guthrie. There was no photograph of Guthrie either. And then shortly before his death, I received a message from Tim McVeigh, who told me, he said, when I saw your brother's picture and heard what happened to him, I want you to know that in my opinion, he was murdered by the FBI because they mistook him for Richard Lee Guthrie. And I looked at a photograph of Guthrie, and Guthrie looked very similar to my brother. But what really brought all the pieces together was a phone call from a, a reporter named J.D. Cash, who had followed the Oklahoma City bombing from the, the moment it happened. He was a reporter in eastern Oklahoma. He'd had family and friends killed in the bombing. And it was in 2003, I believe, or 2004, when I received a call from J.D., and he said, I'd, if you got a minute, I'd like to talk to you about your brother. And I said, sure. And uh, what J.D. said was, describe your brother. And I said, well, you know, he was, and J.D. said, well, how tall was he? And I said, he's about five foot eight, five nine. J.D. said, what was his build like? I said, he was a very powerfully built man. Uh, complexion, I said, he was dark complected. A mustache, yes, he had a mustache. Uh, where was he when he was, he was picked up? And I said, well, he was coming back across the border from Mexico. He'd been down to visit some friends down there. And his, his wife's family, she's Mexican-American, a citizen in the United States, but still have family in Baja, California. And J.D. said, what was he driving? And I said, a mid-1980s uh, a 1986 Chevrolet pickup truck. And J.D. said, did he have any tattoos? And I said, yes. And J.D. said, what kind? And I said, he had a dragon tattoo. And J.D. said, where? And I said, on his left forearm. And J.D. said, oh, shit. He said, "Are you You better sit down. And I said, I'm, I'm sitting down. And he said, let me tell you this. He said, the largest manhunt in American history was for John Doe II. It was occurring at the time your brother was arrested. And J.D. said, this is the description of John Doe too. White male, powerful upper body build, 5'8", five 5'9", foot five foot dark complected, believed to be in Canada or Mexico, driving mid-1980s Chevrolet pickup truck, dragon tattoo, left forearm. And that's when it all came together that they had mistaken my brother for someone else. And that someone else was Richard Lee Guthrie, who was a perfect match, I found out later, for my brother, down to the dragon tattoo on his left forearm. As they said, Guthrie ended up hanging, supposedly suicide, in his cell while in the custody of the FBI. We had an eyewitness to my brother's murder, an inmate named Alden Gildas Baker. Uh, a month before we were going to go to the trial, Baker supposedly hangs himself in his cell while under FBI custody. Again, another suicide. 
And so it was that Kenneth Michael Trinidou was slain in the place of Richard Lee Guthrie. Allegedly, or supposedly, one of the John Doe number twos, who w may have been one of the accomplices of Timothy McVeigh, and or involved in some way or other with various intelligence agencies as an informant. And the long and winding story of John Doe number two has been told many times in many places, but of course there is the story of multiple eyewitnesses who saw Timothy McVeigh both on the day of the bombing and in the days prior to the bombing when he was renting the truck and in other locations with other accomplices, plural. So there, there is some question about John Doe number two and has been ever since the FBI released a composite sketch of John Doe number two in the days after the bombing and then proceeded to scrub him from the history books and pretend that he never existed. And that, of course, did not work so well, and it is now a well-documented mystery of the OKC bombing that even mainstream uh, outlets like Salon will pick up. And I'll include a link to The Mystery of John Doe Number 2 from Salon.com from 2001. So I will leave you to explore that on your own, but I did have the chance to pose this question about Richard Lee Guthrie and his perhaps a uh, role as John Doe number two in the bombing itself to an expert on the OKC bombing, none other than Holland van den Neuenhoff of the Free Mind Report. The Free Mind Report is a spin-off of sorts of Radio Free Oklahoma, and listeners to the interviews RSS feed of CorbettReport.com will remember from last year that I was a guest on that program. Recently, I had the chance to be a guest on the new Free Mind Report, and uh, I just had Holland van den Neuenhoff on the Corbett Report as a guest to talk about the OKC bombing, of course, coming up to the uh, 16th anniversary, and Holland van den Neuenhoff and the members of We Are Change Oklahoma are going to be doing uh, street action on April 19th to raise awareness about the issues related to o the Oklahoma City bombing and the truth movement uh, nature of what's what has been uncovered over the last 16 years and been systematically suppressed. But... At any rate, let's take a listen to an excerpt from that conversation where we talk about Richard Lee Guthrie's role in the bombing itself and the information that has been suppressed about that role. And it's a story that tracks back through Elohim City, the white supremacist compound that evidently was being run infested with FBI, BATF, and SPLC informants. And SPLC might be better known to some of my listeners as the Southern Poverty Law Center. And th that leads back through the intelligence agencies through a German named Andreas Strassmeier. It's an interesting story, so let's turn to Holland van den Neuenhoff on John Doe number 2 and Richard Lee Guthrie. Well, uh, we think that there were several people involved on the ground that day. Um, there were several John Doe number 2s, and I do think that Richard Lee Guthrie was one of them. We've uncovered evidence lately through access to the defense archives of Tim McVeigh, um, reading FBI reports that Richard Lee Guthrie um, may have known several people close to McVeigh, and there was very strong evidence that they did work together on at least one bank robbery. And the fact that another John Doe number two, Michael Brescia, he was a, a racist who lived out of Elohim, Elohim City, a neo-Nazi compound in eastern Oklahoma. Michael Brescia is a, is a look-alike, is a is a, just a knockout resemblance to the John Doe number two sketches. His alibi for that day is sketchy. He was involved with Andy Strasmeyer, who was also involved with the bombing. Um, so, and he, he also knew Richard Lee Guthrie. And Michael Brescia had worked with Guthrie on at least one bank robbery for which he served prison time. So we had this, this whole methodology, these other people involved. And for some reason, the feds do not want to go there. One reason is many of these people were federal informants like Andy Strasmeyer, a known federal informant. He, had, uh, he was a West German intelligence agent. He came to the United States at the behest of German intelligence to investigate the sources of neo-Nazi literature that were emanating from the United States that were going into Germany, of course, to produce or possess Nazi literature in Germany is a crime to this day. So they were going after the source, most of which lies in the United States and some of which was coming out of Elohim City in Oklahoma. Andy Strasmeyer went there. He was also working with uh, federal law enforcement agencies on other projects, and he was likely involved with the Oklahoma City bombing. In fact, we know he was because another informant, uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms informant Carol Howe, has gone on the record saying that 
they, they were talking about bombing the Murrah building in Oklahoma City. She took Andy Strasweyer and others to the Murrah building for scouting missions. She told her handlers all of this before the bombing. All of this was credible before the bombing. Once she went public after the bombing saying that she had warned them, suddenly she lost, she, she lost her credibility and the, the feds tried to actually tried to throw her in jail. But thankfully, she was able to afford a good lawyer who could get her out of the frivolous charges. That's right. And Carol Howe's um, startling story comes from a sealed court transcript that uh, Jesse uh, Trinidou was leaked, and um, he has made that available. And that is now actually available on that interview uh, page that I just uh, conducted with him, and for, available for download. So I certainly hope people will download that and take a look at it, because, uh, again, that's extremely important. But uh, going back for a moment to the issue of, of Richard Lee Guthrie, obviously this is speculative, but why then would do you think they would want to to get rid of Richard Lee Guthrie and ended up doing so with Kenneth Trinidou? Well, Richard Lee Guthrie later ended up dead himself. He was eventually captured uh, on bank robbery, bank robbery charges, and, and he was transferred to a federal prison, actually to to a jail, and he was found uh, dead. They said it was suicide, but it was very strange because. He had already, he was getting ready to testify in a court case, which may have leaked some evidence about the Oklahoma City bombing, and he was getting ready to give an interview and write a book, which he said, in his words, would blow the lid off the Oklahoma City bombing. So perhaps he was going to go public. Um, it's largely speculation. We suspect that he may have been uh, an informer to some degree himself. But what we have, what we can establish for a fact with the bombing is that the ATF and the FBI had a proven methodology of using sting operations, utilizing a Ryder truck and ammonium nitrate explosives. Before the bombing, they were using informants to approach people in the Patriot and uh, on in the um, the white separatist movement. Not that they're one and the same; they're not. But in both movements, there is was some overlap. But they were approaching people with their informants, asking them to blow things up with Ryder trucks and, and ammonium nitrate explosives. This is a proven methodology. Um, what, we, what, we, what we have gathered and can prove is that there was a sting operation using this methodology and that it may have gone wrong for whatever reason. We really don't know why. Others unknown may have hijacked the operation, whether it was some of the neo-Nazi informants who decided to turn the tables on the feds or perhaps a darker element in the U.S. government who saw this exist, existing operation and made it go live, we really don't know, and we won't know until the release of all, all the evidence. But it appears that Richard Lee Guthrie may have been silenced because he was involved with these sting operations, or they thought that he had turned the tables on them. I really don't know. Of course, we can't say for sure on many of these points of fact. We can only speculate because the relevant documents and the things that would help us to come to a conclusion about what really happened have been either destroyed or suppressed or shoved into the memory hole. And unfortunately, we here are looking out from the outside into the uh, inner sanctums of the FBI and the other agencies that have been suppressing this information, and we can only guess as to what's really going on underneath. And there have been people on the inside trying to help out people like Jesse Trinidou, and he has been leaked numerous documents from the FBI, more on which later, but... One of the things that he has been doing in his tireless, ongoing efforts to uncover the truth about the death of his brother is to file countless Freedom of Information Act requests with the FBI for some of the information that they have been suppressing and keep in, keeping hidden from the public, including much of the surveillance footage of what was happening around the Alfred P. Murrah building on the morning of April 19th, 1995. Viewers of my recent video on the uh, last word on CCTV will no doubt remember as some of the, the statements that I made in that video about the footage uh, regarding the Alfred P. Murrah building. And it's a subject that we've covered on New World Next Week at newworldnextweek.com with James Evan Pilato of mediamonarchy.com when recently, uh, I believe it was last year, uh, 26 surveillance tapes were released to Tr Jesse Trinidou by the FBI of uh, CCTV footage from various buildings around the Alfred P. Murrah building and in that area. And every single one of those that would show the approach of the Ryder truck that morning just happened to be being changed at the precise moment that the truck was passing. What an incredible coincidence. Well, I, that was definitely one of the points that I wanted to clarify in my 
lengthy and detailed interview with Jesse Trinidou. So let's turn to an excerpt where we talk about the tapes and also about a pending court case that may even see the actual Alfred P. Murrah building videotapes that would show the bombing itself come to light. All right, well, uh, okay, let's move on to another incredibly important part of this case that you've uh, been extremely diligent in getting information out on and one that I've um, I've talked about before and I think is absolutely central to this case, and that's the issue of the surveillance cameras. And uh, as people may know, you were the one that was responsible for filing a Freedom of Information Act request with the FBI that resulted in the release of 26, I believe, surveillance tapes um, from in, from around the Alfred P. Murrah building on April 19th, 1995. But perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about that case and how it developed. Well, I was leaked um, a government document that said surveillance cameras show the truck bomb detonating three minutes and six seconds after the suspects exited the vehicle. Now, that's significant for a whole bunch of reasons. First, they had cameras that actually showed the truck being driven up to the Murrow Building Park and the people getting out. Well, the FBI says you know, there was only one person in that truck, and that was Tim McVeigh. Well, there was more than one person in that truck, and the other person was probably an informant. You would think that tape would have been Exhibit 1 in the McVeigh murder trial. No one's ever seen it but the government. So I filed a Freedom of Information Act request, and I asked for this. I said, I want the surveillance tapes from the exterior cameras on these buildings leading on the route leading up to the murder building. So whichever, so the route McVeigh took that morning, these tapes were shown in that truck and who was in it with him. And I said, I also want the surveillance tapes from the Alpha P. Murrow building. There were two cameras on the outside of that building. They would have clearly shown who was with McVeigh in that truck. Well, the FBI produces 26 tapes from the other buildings, not the Murrow building. And these tapes, at strategic moments, go blank. And not all at the same time, but it's, you know, the building furthest away goes blank for a few seconds, the tape does. The tape from the next building goes blank a little while afterwards for a few seconds. And, and so on, leading up to the Merle building. So that the moment that truck was being driven by, these tapes mysteriously go blank. And the FBI says, well, that's because the tapes were being recycled or changed. Or, that was, I think that was their excuse. All 26 tapes were being changed or recycled literally within about a three-minute period, between 8.58 and 9.02 on the morning of April 19, 1995. But they don't give me the Murrow building tapes. And so I go to court to get the Murrow building tapes, and there will be a hearing in federal court here in Salt Lake City on May 11, 2011, over those tapes. And the FBI's response has been to the court that we've looked real, real hard, Your Honor, but by God, we can't find those tapes. Let's stop there to, to clarify a couple of points. Um, you, you said there were 26 surveillance tapes that you were that were released to you. Yes, and and every single one of those had a, a, at least some missing time between the eight fifty nine oh five in that period prior to the bombing. The tapes that w- the tapes that would have shown the route. Now, a lot of them were some of them weren't. They gave me interior shots and stuff like that. Those were complete. The exterior cameras dealing with the route go blank. Okay, so it was it was the one specifically that would have shown the approach of the truck. So none of them actually show anything whatsoever of the approach of the truck. That's correct. And uh, re- regarding the Murrah building cameras themselves, I have read that they actually st- were being stored, the, the, the footage was being stored off-site. It wasn't actually tape in cameras on the building. But I have no source to back that up. I don't have any confirmation of that. Is that your understanding, or is there actually tapes that were secured from the building that day? Uh, It's more than my understanding. I obtained two declarations, which is like an affidavit used in federal court. One was from an Oklahoma City uh, police officer who had been on the, I guess it's a special detail that provides security to federal officials who come to Oklahoma. And as part of his responsibilities in that job, he had been taken through the Murrow building, shown the cameras, shown the recording systems off-site. They were recorded off-site. 
and he was also on scene immediately after the bombing, digging through the rubble trying to save people, when he said, almost at gunpoint, the FBI forces them out of the building, and he watches the FBI take down the cameras off the building. I mean, they, they put, it was more important to them to seize those cameras than to save victims in the rubble. More important to the FBI. And he sat there and watched as they took those cameras down, and then they let them back in to do their, their rescue operation. The other affidavit I had was from a man who actually knew the system. Uh, he, what the camera showed were they would tape decks, the recording decks were located, and they were located two or three blocks away in another federal building. That's where the recordings took place. So, yes, those tapes were, exist. Those tapes were never damaged. So if the, the footage is, the, if the footage is being stored off-site, then what is the point of taking the cameras down off the building unless it's to obscure the fact that there were cameras on the building itself? It's to obscure the fact there were cameras on the building. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. But surely no one could think that they would be able to cover that up. Uh, obviously there would be people who would know about that system and would know about those, the existence of those cameras. Well, let me ask you this. Have you seen the photographs of my brother, the body? Yes, I have. Unfortunately, it's uh, quite horrific, but yes. Would you think anyone could cover that up as a suicidal hanging? It does boggle the imagination to think that anyone would be, uh, would be led to believe that, and it certainly, uh, after hearing that the, there was two attempts to cremate the body, I certainly understand why. Well, they've succeeded in covering that up. as a, My brother's murder is a suicidal hanging. Part of the reason they get away with it is there's no investigative media anymore. The First Amendment, the press has fallen far short of, of what the Founding Fathers perceived its role in our government. If you think back to the, you may not be old enough, to the Watergate instance when the, the press was dogged and investigated. That press in those days did exactly what the Founding Fathers thought, and that was to, uh, wanted them to do is, is to monitor the government, to report on what the government was doing. That doesn't happen anymore. And in fact, one of the documents that came out recently that there's been some press on is the FBI has a program of planting moles in the major media outlets, informants. And it's much like the CIA did years ago when they would plant someone in our government and wait for 20 or 30 years until they rose to a position of power and influence. Uh, with access to, to confidential information and an ability to direct policy or, or government action. So that has come out here within the last three weeks, that they had moles in these major media outlets, and you have to only assume that it was for two purposes. One is to obtain information about what, for example, you know, lots of times the press will write a story about the government and you know, have a confidential source. It's to find out who that source was and also to direct stories or to kill stories that are, are embarrassing to the government. Indeed, well, uh, that will tie in to uh, the reports of CIA's uh, Operation Mockingbird and the repeated times in which the, the U.S. military has admitted that uh, military psychological operations officers have been uh, staffing various uh, locations, including uh, CNN's headquarters. So... So once again, there's uh, there's multiple agencies infesting the mainstream media organs, and that's certainly one of the reasons why things like your brother's death do not get reported on. And that uh, brings to, to mind the question regarding J.D. Cash, who you mentioned earlier. Is he still uh, alive? Is he still working on this case? No, J.D. died about three years ago. I see, yes. I, I have read some of his reports, but I, I wasn't aware that, of that. J.D. figured this out early on. He... I'm, what I've done, I've stood on the shoulders of a giant, and J.D. Cash. I mean, J.D., it was a pleasure to work with J.D. for a few years. But J.D. JD figured it out right away that the government had prior knowledge. They had informants. And he, like myself, could never reach a conclusion as to whether it was just a, the sting operation got away from the FBI or whether they actually wanted it to happen. Because you know, people say, why would they want it to happen? Well, they always benefit. They increase funding. You have the Patriot Act and all the other surveillance. And, and you, the American people lose a number of their rights whenever one of these incidents happen. And we seem willing to give up those rights for what we think will be security in the future. 
Absolutely. And that's unfortunately very true. And um, and again, that was very much the case with the OKC bombing. And there is speculation of the files that were contained in the FBI offices in the building. There's speculation about a number of things related to the case and why the, the building itself was blown up so quickly afterwards and all sorts of uh, very unusual circumstances around the bombing itself. But but getting back, I, I think we got a little bit off track from the, the question of the videotapes. And that brings to brings up a uh, a report that was just released on April 10th, Oklahoma City bombing videotapes subject of federal court hearing in Salt Lake City, May 11th. And this talks about a hearing that's going to take place uh, with uh, Judge Clark Wadoops presiding in the U.S. Wadoops. District uh, Wadoops, presiding in the U.S. District Court for the District of Utah Central Division. And it comes uh, some three and a half years after Utah Je- Attorney Jesse Trinidou used FOIA to request the FBI to turn over copies of surveillance video captured April 19th, 1995, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Perhaps you can tell us about this uh, this uh, hearing and what it's going to decide. The hearing is, is over the mirror building tapes. Uh, it's a very significant case for, for a number of reasons. Obviously, the tapes. I mean, if I get access to the tapes, it'll immediately go public. It's, it'll show who carried out the attack on the Murrow building and who else was involved. But more important than that, it goes to the, the core of what is the government's responsibility under the Freedom of Information Act of FOIA. The FBI's position, and it's the position they assert all over this country, that when someone asks for a document or a record that is potentially harmful to the Bureau, the response is, we looked for it and we can't find it. Their position is, all the law requires is for them to look. It does not require them to find and produce a record. And why this is significant in this case is, the tapes exist. So it's not a case where they can say, we don't know if there is a record or not. In this case, there is there are tapes. The second reason it's significant is, in other instances, they've been able to assert a privilege from production, national security, an ongoing criminal investigation. Uh, there's a number of, of exemptions under FOIA that says you can't get records if they fall into these, these documents that are exempt from the Freedom of Information Act. They don't have that claim here. So we have the documents in existence. We don't have any privilege that protects them, the documents being the tapes or the records. No privilege that protects them. And the issue comes down to, is that all the law requires is that the FBI look and report back to a judge that we can't find anything? And my position is that can't be the law because the purpose of the Freedom of Information Act was to give the public access to what the government was doing. And this would defeat... It would eviscerate FOIA if all they had to do was say, we looked and wink, nod, we can't find anything. So my position is, once you know it exists and there's no privilege, you sure as hell have to find it and turn it over. So I assume that currently they're they're trying to hold that they're not even obligated to, to talk about what that search involved or, or what types of records or in what way they were they were searching. Oh, they said they did a computer search and they just can't find it. Well, I've seen in the past, and one of the documents I filed in support of my motion was from a, re- a retired FBI agent that said that in the Oklahoma bombing case, they had what were called zero files. And this was evidence no one was to see. It goes into the zero file. Uh, I also found out in the course of my FOIA request, and this has become rather significant publicly, I happen across what the FBI calls I drives. Uh, in a FOIA response or request, and in a criminal case, the FBI turns over the, the. In a FOIA case, they would request they would search the official file for documents. It's the official file they turn over to the defense counsel in a criminal case. The I drive is where evidence goes before it goes into the official file, and then the FBI makes a determination whether to put it in the official file or leave it in the iDrive where it's never recorded, never reported. And of course they tell me only irrelevant evidence remains in the iDrive. All relevant evidence goes to the official file that's turned over to defense counsel and made available to the public on the FOIA request. Well, I don't for a moment believe them on that. I think what goes into the iDrive is the, the evidence that would acquit somebody or that's embarrassing to the government. 
Absolutely. Well, I, I hate to be defeatist about this, but uh, given the way that uh, in, uh, vital information and, and documentation about your brother's death has been systematically erased and destroyed, could you imagine that the, the incriminating videotape would ever actually be turned over by the FBI? It'll never be turned over. Can you imagine what it would do? It would go right to the high, highest levels of government in 1995. It would go right into the White House. Um, that level of cover-up, that level of... And I'm not a politically motivated person. I I could care less about either party. But it would be devastating. And if you look now, the very people who were involved in keeping the lid on the Oklahoma City bombing are back in power. You know, Eric Holder was the second command under Janet Reno. Uh, in fact, Holder led the cover-up of my brother's murder. There's a whole bunch of emails back and forth where they refer to it as the Trinidad mission. Uh, they liken it to coordinating the invasion of Normandy to keep any investigations from going forward. I mean, it, literally, it's, it's named the Trinidad mission. And they refer to it, in it as Trinidads and Trinidons, meaning things to do and things not to do in keeping the lids on this. And, and this is, he was then Deputy Attorney General Eric Holder was heading that up. And you have to ask yourself, why would the Deputy Attorney General of the United States of America be involved in the death of an inmate? Well, the reason now is simple, because that death goes right into the Oklahoma City bombing, which goes right back to the highest levels of the executive branch. There are so many points to go over in this case, and there are so many points that were even covered in that one-plus-hour conversation with Jesse Trentadue that a simple one-hour podcast could not hope to really get into all of those details. But I think the issue of the surveillance tapes is one of the key issues, because there is absolutely no doubt that if the FBI had the surveillance tape of the truck being driven by Timothy McVeigh acting alone, it would have been presented at the trial. In fact, it would have been given to the media to broadcast on every station worldwide, day after day after day. The point is, that is not what the tapes show, according to the witnesses who have seen the tapes and who have said that it showed a John Doe number 2 getting out of the truck minutes after McVeigh did. So... Unfortunately, we will have to conclude with Jesse Trinidou that it would be almost unthinkable that the FBI would ever allow that tape to surface. But still, the fight is what's important, and fighting to expose the fact that this tape is being hidden can be at least almost as valuable as actually seeing the tape itself, because if we can push this incredibly important aspect of the case into the mainstream, then more people will become aware that they are not being told the truth about the Oklahoma City bombing. Ultimately, today's episode is about the quest of a family to try to get the information about how, when, why, and under what circumstances their family member was killed. And unfortunately, it is a gruesome tale, but it is one that absolutely needs to be told because like so many of these other cases of someone being suicided, the powers that be would not like you to know about this, and they have gone to great lengths to cover up or to attempt to cover up or sweep under the rug the information that Jesse Trinidou and others have been t working tirelessly for years to try to bring to the public's attention. And it's quite true that the media will not tell these stories because the media has a vested interest in not telling the stories. It is up to people like you and me to try to get the word out ourselves because the media is not going to do it for us. Ultimately, this is a quest for truth and justice in a world where there is far too little of either. And to whatever extent that this may be a quixotic battle, it is one that still needs to be fought while we still have some modicum of freedom. I'll leave the last word in today's episode to Jesse Trinidou as he explains what it is that motivates him and his quest for the truth about his brother's death. My family will never get justice for my brother's murder. That'll never happen. The government will never prosecute anybody because it runs the risk of the minute it prosecutes somebody, the whole story, ugly story erupting. But what I can do, and there's, there's no noble, I mean, uh, I, didn't, I didn't start out to, to solve the Oklahoma City bombing. I started out to find out what happened to my brother, and every lead took me to the bombing. But back on the point of justice of why I do this, 
I do it for no other reason than to, I guess, embarrass the devil. Is the only justice we'll get is to humiliate and expose the federal government for the the corrupt entity that it apparently has become, especially the FBI. There's nothing noble in that, and, and I don't want your audience to think that there's anything noble in me. I was a hillbilly. Um, if people know Southern Mountain people, their culture is when you kill one of us, you better kill us all back to third cousins, because sooner or later, if you leave one of us alive, we're going to get you. And I'll get them. I'll never get justice, but I sure as hell hurt them. I'll hurt their reputations. I'll hurt their image. And I like to think I've done that now. And at least there's some indication I've done it. They, some of them, when I deal with the federal government, it's never the local U.S. attorneys anymore. They brought out the, the U.S. attorneys I deal with are brought out the main justice of Washington D.C. And as a, as a humorous aside, one they referred to me as Jesse Bin Laden, and I said I didn't think that was fair because I said there's no way that some bitch hates you more than I do.